Uh, welcome to uh, TSBB uh, talk this afternoon. Um, today, uh, uh, we're going to have a speaker, uh, Dr. Mong Stapleton. I'm very, uh, very happy to uh, introduce Mong Stapleton because we are the member of uh, TSBB program. And uh, uh, when I came here, it was like August, and I was very lonely. <laughs> It's nobody there, and then she helped me all, all the time, right? I mean, until now, of course. <laughs> yes. And then she got a PhD in cognitive science, working with Andy Clark uh, back in 2012, I think. And then also she has been working with Evan Thompson. And this, you know, uh, this tells me that uh, Evan Thompson uh, or uh, the Andy Clark, they are very much like a philosopher of AI and artificial life, which is something it's very much characteristic of artificial life uh, research area, which I think you are also in. <laughs> um, because a life is different, artificial life is different from biology because we have a philosophers, right? So the bridging between philosopher and um, uh, you know computer scientists or physicists is very very important for you know shaping up artificial life studies. And you know the philosophers like Evan Thompson, you know uh, Francisco Barrera Masrana you know, uh, then Andy Clark, she knows everybody, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very much looking forward to what she's going to say today. Um, cool, thank you, Takashi. Um, and thank you so much for stepping in to chair me because Tom unfortunately has COVID. So um, yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, the aim of the talk is to give a brief, overview of traditional embodied cognitive science, or what I call traditional embodied cognitive science. Uh, the people involved in it don't consider it traditional. Um, then I'm going to point towards some aspects of the body that have traditionally been factored out, but may in fact be relevantly interesting. And then work towards con um, considering how reframing our assumptions might impact how we do cognitive science. So first of all, traditional embodied cognitive science. So before I talk about traditional embodied cognitive science, what is cognitive science? So actually most of you in the room are cognitive scientists and this probably doesn't need saying, but for those of you who aren't, um, cognitive science is kind of unique among the sciences is in that it isn't um, a single discipline. So, and it doesn't really have a single sort of research project or re uh, a single research aim that all, people who identify as cognitive scientists agree on. Instead, it's made up of um, several, um, uh, several disparate disciplines. So here is a, it's very loud. Um, here is, um, yeah, the, can you make it like a little bit quieter? Cause it's kind of resounding. Yeah, cool, thanks. Okay. so. Um, the first, the first picture there is from the 1978 proposal of the research program for cognitive science. This isn't really when cognitive science started. It sort of started arising really in the 1950s um, with researchers from these disciplines, especially from neuroscience, artificial intelligence, and psychology. But in, 19, in the 1970s, it was really formalized as this is a research program. We're going to label it cognitive science. We create a journal, the Cognitive Science Journal and the Cognitive Science Society. Um, so in the 70s, linguistics started making a, um, taking a, a very important role. And philosophy and anthropology have sort of always been in and out very important, um, both with researchers from those disciplines asking the questions that are specific to those disciplines um, in cognitive science and also various researchers in the other cognitive sciences, so psychology, artificial and, uh, intelligence, and neuroscience, having an interest in philosophy and an interest in engaging with philosophers in order to try and answer the questions that, that they're interested in. So things have moved a little bit on in the present age. So Recently, psychology has been dominating cognitive science, and there's a little bit of backlash about that just now. Um, but the only main difference is that um, they've started to include education as one of the cognitive scientists, sciences um, in addition to the others. So cognitive science isn't just a concatenation of all of those disciplines, but rather um, 
there's a sort of a Venn diagram where all of those people from all of those disciplines can meet. However, it doesn't mean that if you're doing cognitive science, you need to be engaging in all of, um, that you need to be literate or an expert in all of these disciplines. So Gentner has a really nice way of phrasing how he takes uh, cognitive science to be. So he gives this metaphor of a multilingual set of people who are gathered to solve a common problem. So it's unlikely that the six languages will evolve into a new combined language, rather each person does their best to become bi or trilingual so that they can learn from others. And he says, the most productive interactions are likely to be dyadic or at most triadic. And which ones which take off can't be predicted in advance. And every now and then some group will hit on an area in which enormous progress can be made, possibly leading to a, nub, a new subfield. And apart from these big breakthroughs, little gems of insight will come floating along at more regular inter um, intervals, including disagreements. So discovering that a neighboring field has made assumptions that contradict one's own can be quite enlightening. So this, I take it that this is quite different from the other particular sciences and it makes cognitive science quite unique. So what brings these, these um, disciplines together, they have a shared concern in understanding cognition, mind, intelligence, knowledge, and learning. Sometimes these terms are used interchangeably, and sometimes people want to um, tease them apart um, and be more precise. So the key research questions of cognitive science are how do natural cognitive systems work? How can we model the relevant aspects of cognitive systems? And how can we create artificial systems that implement cognitive functions? And for theoretical or philosophical cognitive scientists like me, I think you can unpack these in, in two related uh, questions. So on the one hand, what is special about natural cognitive systems? And on the other, if we were to build an artificial system that's genuinely cognitive, what would we need to implement? So traditional cognitive science tends to make the assumption that cognition is computation over representations. And they have an attitude that the mind is to the brain as um, computer software is to computer hardware. Um, and this is, this is pretty much the same as, as um, uh, claiming that cognitive processes are autonomous of their neural implementation. So they could be in principle implemented in a different system. Um, and we see this in current research. So the models of cognitive functioning and artificial cognitive systems research, they're neural inspired. So like neural networks are like the name is a bit, bit of a giveaway. They are neurally inspired, but they're heavily abstracted from the morphological and the biological body. And they're divorced from the world in which cognitive systems have evolved and are immersed in and in which their cognition matters to the systems themselves. So Andy Clark has called this traditional view of cognition, the brain bound um, view. And he phrases it like this, the non-neural body is just the sensor and effector system of the brain. And the rest of the world is just the arena in which adaptive problems get posed and in which the brain body system must sense and act. So in this um, brain bound view, we do of course need a body but the bodies are just for keeping the brain alive and for providing sensory input and motor output. We're essentially just brains and bodily that. So if this brain bound model is right, then cognition is done by the brain and is only instrumentally dependent on the body in the world. And this is the assumption I think behind um, the talk of brain transplants into other bodies or into robotic bodies that you see in the media and also behind the, this idea of uploading your consciousness to the internet. Because um, if, the, um, if you can separate cognition from the implementation, then you know, as long as you find some other implementation, um, that yeah, some other means of implementing it, yeah, in principle, you could have your consciousness, your cognition. So what is non-trivial embodiment? So the term embodiment crops up in lots of places and it means a lot of different things in different, different areas. So it covers especially a, a diverse range of theses in analytic philosophy, phenomenology and continental philosophy, gender studies, sociology, linguistics, psychology, neuroscience, cognitive science and artificial intelligence and robotics. But I think the uniting factor of what I'm calling non-trivial embodiment is that the body matters to cognition or to perception or to experience. 
And we can cash this out in three ways. How does the body matter? The body might matter to the way that we think. It might matter in thinking. Um, so the body is part of what we use to think and perceive. Or the body might matter for thinking. So the body is the structure through which we think and perceive. And I mean, I'm going to skip the first one and just go straight to the second. So the body matters in thinking. So Andy Clark has proposed um, what he's called the double O principle, double O seven principle, even taking this from James Bond um, or adapting James Bond. So he says, in general, evolved creatures will neither store nor process information in costly ways when they can use the structure of the environment and their operations upon it as a convenient stand-in for the information processing operations concerned. That is, and this is the 007 principle, not only as much as you need to know to get the job done. So what does this mean? This means that we have lazy brains. So we do as little information crunching as possible. We offload everything else onto the body and the world. Um, so this 007 principle is a response to the kind of cognition first thinking that was responsible for developing uh, robots like Asimo. So this is a really old robot now from 1996, but it's worth watching. Nevertheless, do I need to? So I think this is an example of a, a cognition first design. So um, the robot is doing an incredibly, incredibly complex task and it's doing a pretty good job of it. Like it's sensing and it's moving out of the way, but it's doing this by, whoops. Um, it's doing this by, by sensing, doing some complex calculations, and then sending information to, to its limbs to do, do what it needs to do. Um, and its body is just, um, so the body that's not sensing, the body that's just moving around, um, is just receiving those instructions and moving, and the dynamics of that particular body are having to be cancelled out. So, um, yeah, compared to humans, there's a huge energy expenditure and there's really complex joint movement planning and actuating. It's, it's yeah, really impressive thing to, to uh, design. Um, compare this to um, these passive dynamo, dynamic walkers. Yeah. So here we have none of that. Nothing is, is has been programmed into it. It's literally just its its mechanisms. Um, and yeah, it's got I think quite an astounding gait. When you watch these videos for the first time, um, I think you're really quite shocked at how how natural it looks, even though it's just a just a set of um, metal put together. So here's another one. This one's not on a slope. So that one was using using gravity. Um, so they don't have any actuators. That's the that's the point of them being um, a passive dynamic walker. So that one I think needs a little tap to get going. But then, yeah, she gives them a bit of a push. But then even on the flat, they can keep going in a in a remarkably natural gait. So I'll just show you one more of passive dynamic running, which I think is especially impressive. Um. So this is the kind of movement that, that if we were Taking a sort of cognition first approach, we would think, oh, okay, we need to somehow program in the way that the, the joints are going to move, uh, how, um, 
how far it's yeah things like how how far um how much the joints need to move in in a particular at a particular speed and how to counteract the other one Okay, so wild walkers use passive dynamics. They don't need motors or controllers, and they do this by making use of their morphology. So they're using the shape of their body, the placement of their joints, and the weight of their components. So this is what Rolf Pfeiffer has, has described as morphological computation. And this is one of the things he's really famous for. Um, this is his book, um, How the Body Shapes the Way We Think, where he describes his approach to robotics in the group, I think in Zurich that he was, yeah, I think he still is. Um, so the idea of morphological computation is that the details of embodiment take over some of the work that would otherwise have to be done by the, by the brain or the control system. So they use these passive dynamics and the morphology when possible to reduce computational effort. So it's not that you have to reduce everything to, to a morphological computation, but, but as much as possible, um, use that. Okay, so there's a really um, a good example of this. So um, he, um, if you want to see this in full, not, not this in full, but um, a full explanation, Rolf Pfeiffer has it in his TEDx talk. But um, so here, um, Mike, Rind Mike Rinderknecht has um, evolved. Um, there we go. Um, evolved these little robots so that all of them are just using two simple controllers and yet they change, um, they move in um, well, 43 different ways, but some of them, and so I've, I've taken you right to the end, are particularly interesting ways. Like, they're really ways that, that um, make us feel that they are somehow animal-like. Sometimes you can even recognize a, a kind of animal in them. So this little guy is um, especially interesting because you'll see that they, they put a little bit more, um, they change his morphology a little bit more and he becomes what they call crazy bird. Um, yeah, I'll show you a little bit of that. So this is just having sh changed the shape. Yeah, just ch having changed these little robot shapes. There's, there's nothing else different um, in these. So yeah, in, in Rolf Pfeiffer's TED talk, he explains that they've added some, um, yeah, so that's not quite true. It's not just this change of shape, but they've added some little rubber onto, the, onto his feet. So, so you can get even, even more interesting um, behavior just as a result of adding the rubber. Okay, enough crazy bird. Okay, so if you're interested in Rolf Pfeiffer's approach to, to embodied AI, I think it's worth sort of selling his, um, uh, this, this sort of creation that him and Josh Bongard, his co-author, set up quite a long time ago now, perhaps like in 2012 or before. It's, it's a collaboration between a bunch of different universities and they share, they, they do a shared lecture course and they used to all be available on YouTube, but they seem to now just stream on Facebook. Um, but they're halfway through, so you can follow them on Facebook, this is the Facebook page, and um, they're halfway through the semester just now, so they've got another few quite interesting um, lectures coming up. You can see the list of the different partner sites that, that they do. Um, okay, so the morphological computation idea. 
Um, so Andy Clark thinks that these principles of morphological computation or um, the, this 007 principle um, are the same for cognition, not just for things like walking. So he calls this view extended. So that, um, and he unpacks this as the actual local operations that realize certain forms of human cognizing include inextricable tangles of feedback, feed forward and feed around loops. Loops that promiscuously crisscross the boundaries of brain, body, and world. So, the 007 principle at work in perception and thought. So, this idea that you only need to know as much as, uh, rather, know only as much as you need to know to get the job done. Um, uh, so one classic example that's often used is, well, it's not usually a dog and a frisbee. It's usually like a fly ball and baseball. Um, that we might think, taking a, a sort of cognition, cognition first approach, uh, how do we how do we work out how to catch to catch this ball that's going? I don't really know what a fly ball is, but a, a ball that is uh, going in the air that I need to run and catch. Um, so we might assume that our brains are having to do some really complex calculations. So how fast is the ball going? How fast do I run? Uh, at which angle uh, do I need to run? At which angle is it going to come down? So physics stuff that, that I can't do and definitely dogs can't do. Um, so we might assume that somehow our brains can do this, even though I can't do this. Um, but it turns out that actually you don't need to, to do much of that because there's a, there's a really easy heuristic. What you do is you uh, follow the, um, keep, keep the ball in the line of sight against the horizon and run so that it keeps still in there or something like this, right? And so if you hold your hand out and you, and you just run like that, then you can catch it. So the, what, what we think of as, as a kind of um, cognitive uh, task so perceiving, um, perceiving this ball in order to be able to catch it can be reduced to um, a combination of my body in space and my, uh, the way that I run in space. So the explanation of what we might have thought, the, the explanation of a task, uh, which we might have thought should be an explanation that is of stuff going on in the head actually might need to start including um, our body and uh, our environment, or at least how we act in that environment. And there are similar examples. So using uh, calculating. So we, when we're little, we learn we use our fingers in counting, um, or we use an abacus. But when we put the abacus away, um, people still continue to gesture. They still continue to use use these gestures um, that offloading, in Andy Clark's terminology, offloading um, these sort of uh, part of the cognition or part of the cognitive process onto either the instrument, the abacus or the gesture. So you're not, you're not having to do it all in your head, but rather you're doing it um, as this crisscrossing of body, brain and world. So Andy gives a really nice, um, Example of the tuna. So um, I'll just quote him here because he has a very nice uh, turn of phrase. So he talks about fish, so tuna and dolphins being mavericks of maneuverability and paradoxes of propulsion. So it's estimated that the dolphin, for example, is simply not strong enough to propel itself at the speeds it's observed to reach. In attempting to unravel this mystery, Two experts in fluid dynamics, the brothers Michael and George Triantafilou, have been led to an interesting hypothesis that the extraordinary swimming efficiency of certain fishes is due to an evolved capacity to exploit and create additional sources of kinetic energy in the watery environment. So um, these fishes uh, exploit aquatic swirls, eddies and vortices, so, so the whirls in the water. Um, to turbocharge propulsion. Um, but in addition to this, the fish actively create these waters using pressure gradients. So they, they also use their tails to flip um, to uh, flip the water, which will create one of these, and then push off that a bit like you push off at the end of a swimming pool. Or if you used to pretend to be a mermaid in the swimming pool, the way that with your flippers or whatever, you create 
a certain force that you could then push, um, push against. So he says, aided by a continuous parade of such vortices, it's even possible for a fish's swimming, to, um, swimming efficiency to exceed 100%. So this is the, the lesson of minim, minimal robotics for cognition. So that the co-evolution of morphology and control in a particular environment is a golden opportunity to spread the problem solving load between brain, body and the world. So this changes from seeing the body and the world as problem spaces to seeing them as a problem solving resource. But why is this embodied cognitive science? So, the lesson of morphological computation was if you take a task problem such as walking, um, on the brain band approach, the controller is needed for joint movement planning and actuating like asthma. But on the morphological computation approach, the controller only needs to actuate and the rest is done in virtue of the morphology and exploiting the passive dynamics. So why is this cognitive? Because even though it turns out that this task doesn't need complex planning, we used to think it did. And more importantly, so even if you don't want to call adaptive tasks like walking cognitive, it looks like we can use these same principles to explain how we solve problems that we do think of as higher cognitive function, functions. So like perception is active sensing rather than representing the world, um, which is computationally heavy and doing, doing things like long mul multiplication or accounting using pen and paper or abacus or gestures instead of arith mental arithmetic. Um, forgot that I didn't do a shout out for this. So um, this is Andy Clapp's book. It's actually really old now. It's from like 1997, but it's still, I think, one of the best introductions to embodied cognitive science there is. It's super clear, super accessible. And uh, the Japanese translation was done by none other than uh, Takashi Ikigami, who's here. And it just they just brought out a, a, a paperback edition. So just sell that to you. Um, Okay, so the idea of this extended or embodied or extended versus the brain bound is that this kind of exploitation of our bodies and worlds is pervasive. It's not only for simple adaptive behaviors, even though we've seen that even these, for example, walking are not actually so simple, but also for higher cognitive processes. So the traditional embodied or extended cognitive science project is to see how much of these processes that it, um, are actually explained by morphology or dynamics or exploiting our natural niche and creating new niches to exploit. And therefore how much less computation the brain or the control system actually has to do, even when achieving super high level cognitive processes. And this is an open question, right? There's, there's lots of work going on in cognitive science on this. So. Okay. So traditional embodied cognitive science is pretty, um, there's a sort of a glaring omission um, of the physiological body. They don't really talk about the physiological body at all. They're, all. they're always talking about the body in terms of its morphology, so its shape, or in terms of, um, yeah, its, its ability to, to, act, to, to sense the world and to act in the world. Um, so the physio physiological body on this approach is really still just the vat that's keeping the brain and the morphological body alive. There's no mention of affect or emotions. Um, and this is, I think, coming from a science um, which up until still the, the late uh, 20th century avoided, um, avoided engaging with the topics of emotion and consciousness. So um, there was until pretty recently uh, an assumption that emotions weren't necessarily necessary for cognition and consciousness, and that surely we we're more rational without emotions. And I think we see this, if you watch Star Wars and um, this kind of, I guess, not meme, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so Spock was supposed to be this amazingly rational, rational character. 
But of course, if you know your Star Wars, this is like completely the wrong example to use, even though it's the one that is often used in the literature because Spock was um, Vulcan and they do have emotions, they just learn to suppress them at a young age. So a better example is rather data from, from Star Trek The Next Generation, um, who's an android and so who is designed to uh, be a completely rational, uh, rational creature, um, artificial system. Um, but of course, the writers decide to play with what would happen if we put an emotion chip into data, because of course that's how it works. You can just like have your rational system and then just add emotions in. And we get some quite exciting uh, responses. Um, also, I think perpetuating the idea that, that somehow emotions make you somehow like irrational or uh, a bit contradictory. Anyway, data ends up not liking it. Uh, so I think they take out the chip. It doesn't last. I can't remember exactly how, how long that lasts, but uh, not very long. They don't deactivate him. They just take the chip out. It's OK. Um, so this idea that um, emotion is separate from reason and that emotion might even hinder reason, I think was yeah, really quite quite a strong uh, a strong way of thinking. It was a typical way of thinking up until probably where Antonio Damasio popularized the idea that emotions are are perhaps necessary for good rational decision making uh, with his book uh, Descartes' Error. And since then, he's he's published a whole bunch of books um, on the importance of emotion for for decision making, but also looking into other um, more sort of pervasive uh, internal feelings and their contribution to consciousness. So he uses um, his, his main example, or one of the main examples that, that he, he talks about, which comes up in most neuroscience and psychology textbooks as well, is the example of Phineas Gage, who, who got this uh, tamping iron um, blown through part of his brain, I think the, um, through the prefrontal cortex, um, amazingly survived, even though I think it was like in 1848. Uh, and amazing, amazingly stayed a reasonably like intelligent person. And yet uh, his personality changed quite a lot and he wasn't able to, to really do good rational decision making. Um, so Damasio is famous for caching these kind of examples, and he talks about other examples that he that he's worked with, um, cashing these out in term or terms of rational decision decision making, needing what he calls somatic markers. The, the somatic marker hypothesis is, is one of the things he's most famous for. Um, and yeah, that idea is that that somehow a certain affect, um, some internal feelings, get attached to to our cognitive processes that. Um, as I understand it, basically help people solve a, a localized frame problem so they're, they're able to, to not just carry on, um, just get a bit overwhelmed with all, with all of the different possibilities, but see what the relevant, the relevant possibilities and the relevant actions are in this, in this uh, context. So um, Damasio um, really inspired um, my entry into cognitive science. So what I wanted to do was to work out, okay, well, what kind of contributions is our, our internal body making to cognition and consciousness? And if, if standard cognitive science, a traditional embodied cognitive science is leaving this out, is this warranted or, or should we actually be, be looking at the internal body and including that in our embodied cognitive science? So um, in these two main papers, um, I cash out uh, some of these ideas. And I'm going to very quickly outline the main ideas in this one, the leaky levels and the case for proper embodiment, just to give you a bit of um, a background as to the way that I'm thinking about um, bodily information 
being important for cognition and consciousness. And so to see, uh, to sort of see where I'm going with the, one of the projects that I'm gonna be doing here at Oasis. So in those papers and in my PhD thesis, I argue for the thesis of, pro of proper embodiment. And that is um, combined of two independent theses, but which I think go together. So um, internal embodiment, which is that the internal GUI body matters to cognition and consciousness in a fundamental way. And that the particular details of our implementation matter to cognition. So that's um, particular embodiment. And you can cash that out as a, a kind of a nano functionalism. And the idea is that if you put these two together with traditional embodied cognitive science, so, that, so I have no intention of arguing that traditional embodied cognitive science is wrong in any way, um, but rather just that it's, it's missing. Uh, it's missing a really important aspect. So if you put those together, then you get what I call proper embodiment. So internal embodiment. Internal embodiment is a thesis that the internal GUI body matters to cognition and consciousness in a fundamental way. But what, what is the internal? Whoa. I didn't set it up to be doing this. Okay. Uh, so, um, okay. So, If you look at the different sensory systems of the body as categorized by Sherrington, um, we see that there, you, you can see the telereception, so vision and hearing, proprioception, which is the sense of where the body is in space, um, and kinesthesia, the sense of bodily movement, extraception, so our sense of the external world, touch, temperature, and pain, uh, chemoreception, so smell and taste, where we're, we're coming into contact with chemicals, and interoception. And this is, this is the sense that until very recently, really in, until like maybe the last 10, 15 years, uh, was mostly uh, ignored, but there's been a big boon in, in the um, research into this uh, area. Um, so interoception is the sense of the visceral body, so if you look at that in terms of the, the peripheral nervous system, um, this is um, the afferent aspect of, of the autonomic nervous system. So the interoceptive system gives you information about heart muscle, other smooth muscles, so not skeletal muscles, that's, that comes from the somatic nervous system, um, but things like stomach, intestines, blood vessels and bladder, and exocrine glands, sweat glands, saliva glands, stomach, liver, pancreas. So you might be able to see why I talk in terms of gooiness. It's, it's really, the interoceptive system is really sensing the gooey body. So Bud Craig, um, who is one of the principal researchers or was one of the principal researchers in interoception, um, has argued that interoception should be redefined as a sense of the physiological condition of the entire body and not just the viscera. So to include things like pain, temperature, and light and sensual touch, because um, these are all mediated by the same laminar one spinothalamic cortical system as visceral information. And he calls, um, he calls these, these pain, temperature, sensual touch, et cetera, homeostatic emotions. So they're feelings which have an inherently motivational aspect and they ground what he calls homeostatic behavior. And homeostatic behavior is behavior that's necessary when the autonomic systems on their own aren't enough to keep the body at the right balance to allow the organism to survive. So the idea is that pleasantness or unpleasantness of the sensation, so this is from Craig, is a correlate um, uh, of the motivation itself such that at the extreme of unpleasantness, sorry, this is from Craig, the discomfort grows until it becomes an intractable motivation. Even though it's not painful, you must respond if you're to stay alive. So interoception is the sense of, of the physiological condition of the body, how the body is faring. And this information is inherently motivational in virtue of co-activating motor systems as part of the interoceptive loop. And this information plausibly grounds our feelings of affect and value. 
So I think this is all cool. And I was super excited when I started learning about interception, like halfway through my PhD. But, but why is it interesting for cognitive science? Um, so at least two of the reasons it might be interesting for cognitive science is because interceptive information may be involved in vision and it may be involved in perceptual phenomenology. So, um, so Barrett and Barr, for example, um, argued in a really, really nice article, um, see it with feeling, effective predictions during object perception, that when we perceive an object, the brain quickly makes an initial prediction about that object using low spatial frequency information. And the, the details are filled in by memory. So given the overall gist of a situation or object in context, the brain is left to predict what the, the details might be given might be given previous knowledge. So since this was published, predictive processing has had a huge um, surge in popularity to some people's uh, excitement, to some people's un unexcitement. <laughs> um, but, but there are some aspects of uh, predictive processing that, that, that are, um, so there are some controversial aspects and some people think that it might be trying to explain too much, but, but that doesn't mean that we should throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, so um, Barrett and Barr say, when we perceive an object, the brain quickly uh, makes an initial prediction about that object using low spatial frequency information. And then the details are filled in by memory. So given the overall gist of a situation, yeah, okay. So they use, to, to explain how this is working, they use this analogy of the Dutch style of painting in the 16th and century, 17th centuries. The first, the gist of a situation is sketched, and then over time, through recursive application of ever small dabs of paint, a detailed picture emerges. And this recursive and ever finer dabs of paint in this example correspond to the recursive predictions that are generated as, as a result of errors in the predictions of sensory states. And their thesis is the object perception arises partly as a result of predictions about the value of the object to the agent. And the previous knowledge that's used by the brain to predict the details is encoded in sensory motor patterns, which are stored for future use. And importantly for, for, for us here just now, these sensory motor patterns involve internal sensation. So including autonomic and endocrine information. So sensory motor patterns are sensory in the fullest sense of the term. They not only involve external sensations and their relations to actions, but also internal sensations from organs, muscles, and joints, and how external sensations have influenced these internal sensations. So they show that the connections between these various brain areas give us reason to believe that representations of internal bodily, autonomic, and endocrine changes a part of visual processing right from the stage at which the gist of the situation is being processed by the frontal systems. So even perception at this really positive specificity, it's just a gist, gist stage, it has an effective flavor that helps code the relevance or the value of the object of perception. So this is quite different from the idea of adding a somatic marker and is quite different from you know, the idea of a, you can just put in an emotion chip. This is right, right from the beginning, affectivity is involved. So, uh, okay. okay, so the other reason I think that uh, related to what I've just been saying and, and drawing on the same ideas, um, the second way the, the affect is, is relevant for cognition because it's involved in um, perceptual phenomenology. So it, it doesn't seem like perception is always effective. Uh, why might we think it is? I think looking at this um, quotation from William James gives us uh, a quite good sense of this. So he says, conceive yourself if possible, suddenly stripped of all of the emotion with which your world now inspires you and try to imagine it as it exists, purely by itself, without your favorable or unfavorable, hopeful or apprehensive comment. It will be almost impossible for you to realize such a condition of negativity and deadness. No one portion of the universe would then have importance beyond another, and all the whole collection of things and series of its events would be without significance, character, expression, or perspective. Whatever of value, interest, or meaning 
our respective worlds may appear imbued with are thus pure gifts of the spectator's mind. So we can see the same idea in Barrett and Barr's paper um, uh, in, in their model. So when they say, uh, when affect is experienced so that it is reportable, it can be in the background or foreground of consciousness. When it's in the background, it's perceived as a property of the world rather than the person's reaction to it. Unconscious affect, as it's called, is why a drink tastes delicious or is unappetizing. Uh, why we experience some people as nice and others as mean, and why some paintings are beautiful while others are ugly. When in the foreground, it's perceived as a personal reaction to the world, the people like or dislike a drink, a person or a painting. Affect can be experienced as emotional, such as being anxious at an uncertain outcome, um, depressed from a loss or happy at a reward. The Barrett and Barr's model provides good reason for thinking that interceptive information provides a constant source of effective information, which is experienced pre-reflectively, so it's not the object of the attention, but it's rather that which is uh, shaping our perception of the world, and thus pervades our experience, even, even when we're not in an emotional state. And Damasio has also argued that interceptive information integrates with information from the extraceptive sen senses, early stages of processing. So he, he has a different model. And he thinks that this is because in the superior colliculus, um, there are three varieties of maps, visual, auditory, and somatic, and they're in a spatial register. So this means that they're stacked in such a precise way. Uh, I'm not a neuroscientist, so I don't actually know which way the map is stacked, but yeah, they're stacked in, stacked in such a precise way that the information available in one map for say vision corresponds to the information on another map that's related to hearing or body state. There's no other place in the brain, he says, where information available from vision, hearing and multiple aspects of body states is so literally superposed, offering the prospect of efficient integration. The integration is made all the more significant by the fact that its results can gain access to the motor system by the nearby structures to the, um, to the peri periaqueductal gray, as well as the cerebral, cerebral cortex. So we see strong, strong connections with um, uh, Craig's work, Amber and Barr and Damasio. So um, is it just that, that this kind of effective information shapes uh, how we experience the world without really um, affecting our cognition as such? Um, perhaps not. So for example, Um, Michael Gauss and colleagues, I think it's Gauss or Gauss and colleagues, um, have looked at how um, fear can actually change the the width that you that you uh, the width between gaps that you judge, and also um, how you so, so not only when they were asked to judge how how far is this gap. Um, when people were in a fear state, they would judge that gap to be wider, but they would also, if they were asked then to walk over it, they would also um, walk over wider, which is pretty interesting because um, there are some visual illusions that we, that, that are quite common in cognitive science. So there's one like with a coin that's a, a different shape that, that you might judge it to be bigger or smaller. I forget exactly how it goes, but you, when you go to pick it up, your fingers will go to the right. Um, how you have the right size. So, so this is this is really interesting that the affect can can really change your perception and your action. So it's really involved in in um, that cognitive processing. So um, so the moral of this section, there's one more section which I might try to rush through um, is in natural cognitive systems like ourselves, Having an internal body shapes consciousness and cognition, even when the interoceptive or effective information is unconscious or pre-reflective. And the information that feeds into cognition and consciousness is imbued with a natural value in terms of value to the physiological system. So there's an important implication of this is that to create, to create an artificial system that's genuinely cognitive in the ways that we are, we might need to implement some kind of functionally equivalent internal body. And this is what I argued in my Steps to Properly Embodied Cognitive Science paper back in 2013. And um, 
which Kings and Mann and Antonio Damasio are making some steps towards in their 2019 paper, Homeostasis and Soft Robotics in the Design of Feeling Machines. But it's at a very, very, still very uh, nas nascent stage. These are, these are still, this is still not the, uh, not the orthodoxy. This is not where most cognitive science is going, but it's a really interest. There, there are steps being made towards it. Okay, I will just give you a gist of the particular embodiment stuff. Um, so the idea of this is that the particular details of our implementation matter to cognition that implies any functionalization of the substructure of cognition would need to be at a fineness of grain that functionalizes these details. This is what I call nano-functionalism. Um, and in my paper and in my thesis, I, I explored two proofs of concept. So both I think from Sussex, uh, which we have some people who have Sussex backgrounds here, I think, um, um, or at least connections. Um, gas nets and evolutionary robotics and evolved hardware. Hardware. So I was going to very briefly give um, an overview of Adrian Thompson's work on evolved hardware, um, but I think um, Uh, yeah, okay, I'll see what I can do. Um, okay, okay, so, so very briefly, and I know there are a lot of people in the room actually who know this, this kind of research a lot better than me, so probably it doesn't matter if I just give a really um, um, very brief overview. So typically in evolutionary robotics, algorithms are evolved in simulation and then transferred to hardware. And what Adrian Thompson is quite famous, I think, in the field for is evolving algorithms straight onto the hardware. So um, he takes this uh, um, large silicon chip the, the, um, uh, that is essentially empty so that using a computer, you can configure the switches in the array um, to create a physically real um, electronic circuit. And he used this array to control a real world robot. And using evolutionary algorithms to configure the switches, um, he was able to evaluate the circuit based on its performance on a task in the real world, modifying it based on evolutionary algorithms until the performance was satisfactory. So what the we don't really need to know the details of it. And um, I'm not really technical minded, so, so what I'm really taking is the, is the gist of, of his experiment anyway. But the, the gist is something really, really surprising. So despite this chip being a digital chip and that the experiment was to evolve a recurrent network of logic gates, the gates in the chip weren't used to do logic. Instead, evolution used whatever behavior these, these high grain groups of transistors happen to exhibit when connected in arbitrary ways. And that's his terms. So a quarter of the cells could be observed to be contributing to the behavior, but some of those weren't actually connected to the main part of the circuit. So that's, that should be surprising, right? So what, ha what happened was there was an exploitation of the physical characteristics of the chip. So it enables the system, this enabled the system to evolve solutions which have greatly decreased computational complexity than traditionally designed, so what I've been calling like cognition first algorithms. So the, here, it's still, yeah. So here the line between the algorithm and implementation has been blurred. It's no longer a trivial matter. If, if we follow, um, yeah, if this is right, then, then it's no longer a trivial matter to just implement an algorithm evolved on one particular piece of hardware onto another piece of hardware. Because it's, it is an algorithm, but it's so entwined with the implementation that, that it's, uh, it's, yeah. You, you can't just put it on another, it, it's, it's using the particular details of that implementation. So Adrian Thompson compares, um, I, think, I think this is the, this first picture is a pretty good example of what I've been calling cognition first. So this design by humans, we think about what, what, what do we think, um, how do we think things would, uh, would process things? How, how do we think, how would we design things? Um, rather than design for evolution, it just, it just proceeds by taking account of the overall behavior effect of variations. 
So this tinkering actually actually uses whatever is being it's being implemented in. It, it's not separating out this algorithm and implementation. Um, so he says quite nicely, in evolution, there's no analysis, simulation, or modeling. So no constraints need to be placed on the circuits to facilitate these. Evolution proceeds by taking account of the changes in the overall behavior as variations, usually small, are made to the circuit structure. This means that the collective behavior of the components can be freely exploited without having to be able to predict it from a knowledge of their individual properties. Evolution can be set free to exploit the rich structures and dynamical behaviors that are natural to the silicon medium, exploring beyond the scope of conventional design. The detailed properties of the components and their interactions can be used in composing the system level behavior. It takes considerable imagination to envisage what these evolved circuits could be like. The kinds of systems we're familiar with, for example, digital, discrete time, computational or hierarchically decomposed circuits are but a subset of what is possible. So to summarize, Adrian Thompson's shown that the more efficient design solution can be to utilize the properties of the hardware and that this is what evolution does. So it's no longer clear what's algorithm and what's implementation. It can all be specified as an algorithm, but as an algorithm specific to this particular implementation. This no longer sounds like the algorithms of traditional cognitive science. So the moral of the story for a particular embodiment is that the solutions that have evolved to make us the flexible, adaptive, neurally plastic cognitive systems that we are, are likely a result um, of the exploitation of our particular embodiment, like our particular embodiment, um, over evolutionary and developmental time, and plausibly even over the time of the plastic changes that underpin new learning. So what I'm calling nanofunctionalism is this because this line between algorithm and implementation for a cognitive system is much blurrier than we normally suppose. So if you're going to build a truly cognitive artificial system, then it might have to have functional versions of our, much of our own, some very tiny implementation. So interceptive stuff, gooey stuff, gassy stuff, that's from the gas nuts idea. Okay, so traditional embodied cognitive science, then this is like almost done. Um, so some of the, um, on the traditional embodied cognitive science uh, approach, some of the computational work essential to cognition can be partially offloaded to and realized by bodily processes and structures external to the central nervous system. And so cognition is thus embodied or extended so that it encompasses parts of the body and plausibly also those parts of the non-biological world that support the appropriate offloading of computations. But this means that as far as traditional embodied cognitive science is concerned, the body qua body, like our bodies don't actually play a special role, only the body in virtue of its ability to be a vehicle of computations and to offload cognition onto. And the result is that, although research in this paradigm is based on the role of the body in cognition, the body really isn't the important factor. So what I'm moving towards is what I'm calling a body first approach to cognitive science, um, which is not supposed to be in opposition to a cognition first approach, I still think that there's loads of really good research that can be done under that, but is rather a call for taking at the same time a different approach. Um, so to see what falls out of that. So the body first approach is to instead of assuming that you can abstract away from all the bod biological bodily processes, assuming that you can't. And of course, to do science, you have to abstract. That's 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 normal. Um, but you can factor out some of these for the purposes of a particular explanatory project and then shove them back in. So, and when you are factoring them out for the purposes of a particular explanatory project, making explicit what is being abstracted from and why. So how would this change how we approach cognitive science? It would make the assumption that there uh, likely is a proper bodily contribution rather than assuming that there isn't. So, um, or rather we should make the assumption. Um, so when we're doing experimental research on cognitive functions, considering carefully how much of the generic physiological activity should we also be measuring to, to look for correlations, instead of just assuming that there won't be a proper bodily contribution. Obviously you can't measure everything and you can't just, yeah, look at everything or mish mosh together, that's too much. You, you have to abstract away. But by assuming that there, there really might be these contributions, then uh, we should look at that. Okay, so finally, what am I doing here at OIST? I think that 
But um, yes, yeah, so this is all background. Everything I've shown you uh, talk to you so far um, has been like previous work, some of it from, from quite a while ago. But I think the uh, recent research in neuroscience and neurophysiology seems to support this idea that the substructure of cognition um, in evolved systems might be at least sometimes at a much finer grain than previously supposed. And I think that there's, there's um, recent research showing, for, for, um, for example, the role of glial cells uh, in neural computation and that different parts of the neuron might contribute to computations and that molecular signaling might be involved in neural computations rather than just modulating them. And it might also involve processes of the body proper. So like, for example, different phases of the heartbeat cycle might affect some kinds of information processing and the immune activity and effects associated with changes in cognitive um, processing and plausibly even microbiome differences um, uh, some people are arguing are involved in cascades that affect cognitive functioning. So I want to explore what bodily parts and processes that cognitive sciences, scientists have traditionally factored out because they're either deemed irrelevant to cognition or considered to be mere implementation, might in fact be relevant to understanding and modeling cognition. And then to work out how best to conceptualize this for cognitive science rather than, for example, neuroscience. So will it change what we take cognition to refer to? Will it change how we view ourselves as cognitive creatures? And if we're going to build artificial systems that are genuinely cognitive, how much of the biology of evolved cognitive systems will we need to implement? So do we need to move from like a soft robotics to a, to a gooey robotics? And while I'm here until the end of March 2023, I'm going to be working on um, one of the things I've, I'm, I'm going to now start doing uh, is to work on an opinionated interdisciplinary review paper on this topic. So if anyone here has any suggestions of research from your field of expertise that you think I should know about, um, either that might um, be in line with some of the stuff I've been talking about or might uh, contradict it, whichever is really helpful and useful, I'd be really grateful to learn of it. So finally, thank you for your attention and to the OIST SVP program for giving me the opportunity to visit OIST, to Tom Fraser and the Embodied Cognitive Science Research Group, for including me in their activities and for Takashi for introducing me. Um, thank, thank you. Thank you, Mom. That was wonderful. Two minutes of questions. Um, yes. Uh, can I, Jonas, can I take? Uh, yeah, okay. So. Um, but I'm here till the end of March, so it doesn't have to be now. Oh, yeah. No, no one no. likes these questions but, anyway. Yeah, but so. anyway, so. Uh, we can take you know a few questions and comments if you go on yeah oh yeah okay please much i have a lot of questions but i will ask one question you mentioned like word consciousness one or maybe two times in this presentation so what is like relation between cognition and consciousness and like, does this all this means that like, if like we need to have like like really clever robots, is like they need to suffer and like feel pain and all this stuff? Yeah, that was a mistake to include it even two times. <laughs> <laughs> I usually try to avoid all talk of consciousness because I mean, what do we even? I mean, what do we even mean by consciousness? What? what, what oh, yeah, I think. It, <laughs> uh, so I think in general, it's better to not talk of consciousness. It's just really too messy. Um, we might talk about experience, which, yeah, which I think is slightly better because well, partly it's like not like a thing that something might have, but rather like maybe a thing that things do or that things, yeah. Um, uh, so I guess the question is if we evolve these kind of properly embodied systems or what, what I think Tomasio is called homeostatically oriented systems i forget his exact term so yeah so his idea is putting some kind of feeling feelingy stuff into it so i think it's a oh i think what you mean is are they going to be aware that they're aware um so i think probably i think maybe they might have a kind of a sentience they might be aware but if we're going to make them aware they're aware a lot of other stuff's going to be have to piled in do i think we can do i mean I kind of hope not because probably we don't want to, I think you might differ in this. I think I, I think I don't want us to create artificially conscious creatures. 
yeah. with yeah. too much suffering in the world already, why, why give more? Uh, but, yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, another question, comment? Yeah, please. Oh, hello. Oh, sure. So uh, I'm wondering that about you. Um, so, so in the artificial, uh, artificial intelligence community, the biggest problem uh, they always try to solve is the generalization. So you you learn some. So on uh, artificial age, uh, artificial intelligence, learn something, and uh, they um, the problem is usually uh, whether the the particular uh, the learned algorithm learned uh, learned algorithm can be generalized to another context. So I'm wondering that the, whether you have any idea about how embodied cognitive science can solve the, um, uh, this, gen can give a um, insight about this generalization problem. Also another related problem is that the body condition changes almost constantly. Mm -hmm. So if you like, Talk, you've been talking about almost an hour and, uh, and the, your, your voice cord, your, your, your focal cord literally changes um, its condition within, I don't know, like within uh, 10 minutes or something like that. And the, but the cognition, uh, the cognition is almost invariant. You can, you maintain the focus, cognitive focus almost for an hour to give the nice, the nice talk. And so I'm wondering that the whether how you can, if the cog, uh, cognition, our cognition is, is forms a loop with respect to the, our body, um, how would you explain the discrepancy? Yeah, I guess I don't, I don't think there is exactly a discrepancy. I do think that there are changes that are, yeah, uh, changes that contributions of our body are making to our cognition all of the time. And so we do need to bring time into our consideration of, of cognition. Oh, did I? Maybe I'm just not talking. Um, uh, yeah, so we need to bring time into our considerations of cognition. But I guess also what I think your question brings out is what we're talking about when we're talking about cognition. So in one sense, yeah, I was cognitive over that whole period. I was able to like talk, sort of think. I was more in performance mode rather than thinking mode, but um, yeah, so I was like a working cognitive system, but the different sort of cognitive tasks that were going on might have been affected by the differences. And so, so like, yeah, so some of this research of like heartbeat, I think so like when it's diastolic, it's like you, you process certain things differently. Um, so there are there are contributions that the the body is making that may actually affect some of the yeah some of our cognitive processing that that we're not taking into account or why that rather that we're just not assuming happens um, mapping out exactly what's going on in there is I think still like a project that needs to be done but I think I think maybe we shouldn't assume that just because yeah just because I'm sort of standing here talking at you that that. That there weren't changes in my cognition over the period, reflecting um, maybe fatigue or anxiety or whatever. Um, your first question was generalization. Uh, I th if I understand the question right, I think that I guess my approach is that we shouldn't maybe be looking to generalize too much, but rather to be. Yeah, looking at more at particular. Well, yeah, looking more at particular embodiments, and so not assuming that that much can be can be generalized. So of course you can still you can still make abstractions about what's going on, but that that doesn't mean that uh, you can then take that abstraction and then implement it in another system. So it's not generalizable in that in that way, but rather yeah, rather that um, yeah the relevant processes are really tied to our our evolved in particular embodiment. Yeah, so so my, my, the, um, so you, you mentioned that that the, the our heartbeat uh, actually impacts our uh, some some aspects of cognition. It's absolutely true. Yeah, the, the our body movement uh, 
you know, that there has been reported that the how 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 rapidly I move our body um, also changes the time time perception. So that yeah. is absolutely and but, and yeah, some some feeling states and maybe yeah, other kinds of perception. I'm thinking of like Sarah Garfinkel's work, but I, I don't have a like um it's not strong in my memory just now. But yeah, I think yeah. in various ways. Yeah, yeah, but there there are like invariant aspects of the cognition, right? So if you if you think about, I don't know, so like, yeah, so there, there are definitely uh, invariant aspects of the cognition that doesn't depend on the your your how much heart, heartbeat uh, you you currently have. So, so I'm wondering that the, how would you like go go between the invariant relatively invariant cognitive uh, function and uh, and the uh, Another yeah. type of the cognitive function that is truly in, uh, affected by the body condition. Good. Okay. Yeah. I think they, they need to be mapped out as to which are and which aren't. And I guess I, I probably don't want to make such a strong claim that all cognition uh, um, embodiment, that kind of particular embodiment, is is relevant for all cognition. Um, I think it's worth mapping out where where it is and where it isn't. What contributions it does make. Does it make? Does it still make contributions? to that um the kind of cognition you're talking about um but over time and when it so like um should we still should we still be understanding it as as affecting that cognition or as even constituting that cognition when um yeah when those changes don't don't affect it right now but but do um do affect it yeah over over time yeah i think I think I think uh, you're probably right, um, but just that needs mapping out and seeing where where we should make what claims. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, well, so, so so you're saying the GUI uh, GUI uh, soft robotics that you said, you know, yeah. transition from uh, software robotics to uh... yeah, which I think is where Demasio is going with his oh. homeostatic machines, but. Um, uh -huh. Um, the idea of that, but perhaps not as radically as, as yeah, I want I was, to go. I was making a, you know, moving oil droplet, right? Moving, uh, moving oil droplet. Oh, yeah. Then I was thinking that maybe this can be the next generation of robotics. The big problem is that we cannot go, you know, cognitive. Yeah. Highly cognitive systems, right? So um, I was just wondering, you know, uh, and then also I think the computer is not a good metaphor for our cognitive system. Yeah, right? I see. And then if you can come up with some, something like a new metaphor, that would be yeah. awesome. So I just want to. Uh, yeah, that's a good, yeah, good comment. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so if there are any, oh, okay, yeah. Sorry, yeah, just a comment. It, it just, it occurred to me, um, I learned not long ago that bacteria have, uh, sensors the point outside the cell, but they also have sensors the point inside the cell and measure really? stuff that's on the inside. Um, and there are, um, yeah, there's there are studies into behavior that de that depends on what happens inside the cell. So the kind of gooey bodies may be important for bacterial cognition also. Yes. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Yes, and that makes sense because otherwise, why would they sort of go towards um, sugar when when they're depleted in it or something? Yeah. So so typically they have they can sense sugar directly, like they'll have a, a sensor directly for sugar, uh, but they also have sensors for like generally sensing things that are good that are good, right? But, okay. So because they can sense their own internal metabolites as well, so they so it's kind of a bit of both. That's really cool. I should find that reference from you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, um, yeah, any other comments or questions? <laughs> no, then okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, again, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, great talk. Thank you.